Welcome back ladies and gentlemen, in this video I'm going to be reviewing my debate with Dean Responds. Last night me and a Muslim YouTuber, Muslim Dai, called Dean Responds engaged in a debate on Godlogic's channel in a live stream where we were debating whether or not the Quran affirms the previous scriptures. Now I know what you're thinking, but Chris how did you get a guy to actually debate you on that topic? And the answer is, I don't know, he just sort of wanted to do it. So I was more than happy to oblige him. As many of you know, it's quite difficult these days to get Muslim apologists to openly defend the Quran, particularly in the case of the Islamic dilemma, because it's challenging. Let's, let's go with challenging. It's not, not the easiest thing to do. So when a couple of weeks ago I was on Godlogic's live and Dean Responds joined and personally said, hey, we should have a debate on this topic, I thought, brilliant, finally, an opportunity to debate all of the things I've been studying for the last few months, I thought this is great. So I went and got, one second, I went and got a few books. So so Martin Whittingham's A History of the Muslim Views of the Bible is something I've had for a long time now and I would highly recommend this if you're interested in the topic of the Islamic Dilemma. And I also got this one from Dr. Gordon Nickel. This is called A Gentle Answer to the Muslim Accusation of Biblical Falsification. It was actually Bob, uh, Bob of Speaker's Corner who recommended this. And I'm glad he did. I was familiar with Dr. Gordon Nichols' work mostly because of the commentary he wrote on the Quran and its biblical inflections, we might say. And so I was chuffed to see he had actually addressed this topic directly and written a book about it. So thank you, Dr. Gordon Nichol. Big help. So anyway, onto the debate. We had God Logic as the Christian moderator, and we also had someone that Dean brought on, who was another Muslim dai known as Ibrahim. He was the moderator for Dean, representing the Muslim side. Now the first thing that I noticed actually came after the debate, because in a debate you're focusing on listening to what your opponent is saying so you can properly address what they're saying, you're focusing on giving the best presentation you can to make your case, you're focusing on making notes, yes, like those notes. And you're not really paying attention to what's happening on screen, particularly on other people's cameras. So when it came to looking at the comments after the debate, People kept pointing out that Ibrahim and, uh, and Dean responds, they were somewhat preoccupied. <laughs> you watch the footage and they're just glued to like some sort of tablet or some sort of phone or something they've got that they're holding onto and they just keep looking down. And everything I had was, was pre-prepared. It was either pre-prepared or it was just me thinking and rationalizing things as I went along. But for them, they seem to have a different approach of having a DAWA, it's not a DAWA script, it's more like a DAWA presentation because Dean Responds shared his slides, his deck that he was presenting with and it was kind of like an already prepared master copy of everything that could possibly come up. So I made three points in the debate. I said, hey, point number one, it's not plausible. In fact, it's not even possible that there has been universal interfaith corruption between the Jews and the Christians regarding the Enduring Torah at any point in history. He didn't respond to that at all. <laughs> Basically, just ignored that. Like, not, not, uh, not going to deal with that one. The second one was the moral dilemma that is introduced when you try and say that the Torah and the Injil are corrupted because the Christians are still accountable to this, and so are the Jews, to the Torah, and yet they don't actually have the ability to follow through with the commands, the laws, the theology that's contained in these books because they've been corrupted. It's a bit like me saying, hey, you need to follow what's in your book, and if you don't, you'll be considered among the losers. But by the way, that book's been heavily corrupted. I'm not going to tell you where. In fact, I won't actually send another messenger to fix this issue until 600 years after my last messenger. So uh, good luck with that. Again, seemingly very little interaction on this point. Dean tried to sort of like weave it in on other slides. At one point he introduced a slide about no one can change Allah's words, which is kind of funny because I never brought that up. <laughs> it was never my argument, but he brought it up and felt like it needed to be addressed anyway. So he was kind of like, he was having a, a one fixed solution to the Islamic dilemma that just had to cover every possible problem rather than just address my argument. The real kicker that really made me kind of smile was the first thing Dean Response said in his intro was that he summarized the Islamic dilemma. Ah, brilliant, great stuff. I mean, I did a similar thing, but he's gonna do it as well. Brilliant, we should be totally aligned. Yeah, there shouldn't be any differences or anything like that. Oh wait, he says, I think that I have to show the Quran affirms all of the Bible, all of the Bible. Of course, at no point did I ever say this. In fact, I actually intentionally avoided using the term Bible as much as possible, instead using more descript and accurate terms like Torah and Injil. Because really, if the Quran affirms either one of those things, 
then the Quran contradicts itself. If the Quran affirms something that contradicts the Quran. So, and he phrased this as a steel man. He thought he was taking my argument and raising it to the best it can be presented at when he couldn't even get the basics right. I, I think, again, this is because he was using this template that had already been made rather than just reasoning. And that's and that's a sad part of it. If he just thought about it, he could have presented my case perfectly fine, but he was committed to this template. So he had to do with what the template said. Next point I noticed was his slides were very quick. Like he would show a slide, talk about it for like five, 10 seconds, then immediately change to the next slide. But that slide was quite information heavy. There's a lot going on in there. So by the time I even figured out what he was even showing me, he had switched to the next point. So it was kind of difficult to see, at least visually anyway, exactly what he's dealing with. So in the end, I just focused on listening to what he was saying rather than following the presentation. And it was very poor. He tried to argue certain verses demonstrate universal corruption, but like none of the early tafsir ever held this view. So, I mean, that's, if he couldn't show me a point that refuted that, so yeah. That passes. Overall, I think his introduction was kind of rushed and not focusing on the points I was making. Just like one template will fix all. Just pick slides that he thinks are relevant, even if they don't match up to what I've actually said. Which is a shame. I would have preferred a bit more just interaction rather than just going through a template that he's prepared in response. And finally, I took issue with the fact that he decided to, uh, to have a slide that just called us or just Christians in general clowns or at least anyone who holds the Islamic dilemma, which is um, interesting coming from someone who dressed up for the occasion. But nonetheless, I simply reminded him that these kind of insults in a debate as one of your slides <laughs> for defending the Islamic dilemma is uh, is pretty weak. It's pretty weak. But, you know, if he wants to do that, you know, all power to him. And we move on to the favorite part of this debate, the part that... Um, I couldn't believe went the way it did, in all honesty. Remember how I said he had like a template response for things and uh i mean he's also like you know looking under the table he's got his phone he's texting <laughs> he's texting ibrahim and ibrahim's responding to him like hey you should say this you should say this don't say this keep in mind again during this whole debate you just constantly keep seeing them just looking down at their phone or something like this and it's so obvious because it's like look guys how obvious is this right if i if i look at you like this and i'm talking to you and then i do this how obvious is it that I'm now typing on my phone. I think this is pretty obvious, but if I just keep looking back, you won't notice that I'm doing this. But yeah, through the whole debate, both of them seem to be messaging people. There was even an awkward point where there was like a phone notification sound playing through someone's mic and I thought, oh, okay. These guys are messaging in real time. And when it came to the cross section, it became so much more pronounced. I had prepared very concise questions for my opponent for Dean Responds to address. And like I said, I took some notes as, as I was doing so. Okay, so Din, do you have any manuscripts of either the Islamic tour in Injil? Uh, of the uncorrupted form? Yeah. Uh, no, we don't have any manuscripts at the time of Jesus, neither at the time of uh, Moses, peace be upon them both. No manuscripts. Okay. Um, do you have any records of Isa's companions quoting the Islamic Injil? Of Jesus' companions? Isa's companions, from your perspective, the Islamic perspective. Within the Quran and Hadith, you're asking. Anywhere, it, it can be any writing. No, I I don't I don't see why that would be a necessary condition. Though. We don't have anything no. like that. Recorded testimony. Okay. Um, do you have any evidence at all of any Islamic injil or Torah? Uh, I I just told you so. It's in an unpreserved form. No, that we, we wouldn't have. No evidence of Torah or injil. And to be fair, and you've got to get credit where credit's due, Dean actually responded quickly and he did the best. I think, he, I think he was genuinely trying to do his best. He wanted to give a concise response that was accurate, that would, an that would actually answer the question. So props to him for doing that. Like I, I really was thinking he would try not to do that and to come up with some other way out. But no, he, he actually did. Like to, to the best of my knowledge, it looks like he actually did try to answer the questions. It's just that the, as, as it went on, it just became more and more evident. His, his approach is just not consistent and just doesn't make any actual sense. He admitted straight up there's no evidence for his position. He can't demonstrate any manuscripts of the Injil or the Torah, the supposed Islamic Muslim one. He agreed that there was no direct writings that we had, like manuscript copies of or even referenced that go back to Issa's companions. And I just flat out asked him, is there any evidence for this? And he just said no. So um, yeah, that was a thing. And, and me cross-examining his point was so just brutal 
at getting to the truth of what was going on here. At one point, he said his own position was inconsistent. And I asked him, you said this is inconsistent. And he said, yes. And then try to explain why it was inconsistent. It's an intuitive point that I'm saying regarding the Torah. It's not a consistent approach where you have to apply this for every single thing. It's not a consistent approach. Yeah. So you have one approach for the Torah and it's, one approach uh, for the Injil. No, this is one justification for the Torah specifically. It's not a justification for the Injil. I mean, I couldn't have argue, I couldn't have had a better cross section. I'm I'm not gonna lie. I think that went so well. Let's watch this because I think it's worth watching. Let's go. Okay, so when was the Torah corrupted? Yeah, so it would be corrupted as I said before uh, during a time where it wouldn't be massively transmitted. And like Arazi makes mention of this, Ibn Taymiyyah makes mention of this. At times where it wasn't massively transmitted is most likely the time where it was corrupted. They make mention of it being possibly during like the Babylonian exile. Okay, so this was before Isa. Yep. Okay, but Isa confirmed the Torah that he had. Yeah, he generally confirmed the truths found within it. Uh, I told you, like I made mention of this in my opening statement. Uh, I don't think you followed it. So a prophet can confirm a corrupted book. Yes, he can generally confirm the truths within the corrupted book, yes. But he called it the Torah when it's not the Torah, is it? Yes, we identify things by um, the contents of it being the majority, and the majority of the Torah is preserved. So he would call it Kitab Allah. He would call it the Book of Allah. Uh, Ibn okay. Tamir makes mention, of, makes mention of this, that the uh, Torah is mostly preserved. So it only makes sense that he would identify it by the majority of its contents. Okay. Is the majority of the injil preserved? The Islamic injil? Uh no, no, I, w I wouldn't be able to to know that because okay, it's so never called. The crime... it, it's, yeah, it's never called Kitab. It's never called Kitab Allah. It's never called the words of Allah. It's only made mentioned in parts where uh, to to actually apply it, it would be titled as uh, Injil, never uh, as those titles as I mentioned before. So, uh, in terms of the speeches, commandments, and preachings and parables, uh, they're generally found there in semi corrupted forms. So, if you're gonna say. In that sense, the, the, the speech of, of Jesus, peace be upon him, I wouldn't be mind in saying that uh, there's, a, there's a good amount preserved within it. But it's not the majority. I wouldn't be able to give you like a percentage on the Injil. Yeah, I wouldn't mind in saying it's a majority as in more than 50%. I wouldn't mind in saying. Okay, so but, if the Injil but, but, is but, but, majority... Yeah, but just, just, just let me clarify for 10 seconds. So even, even if I was to hold the position that it's not more than 50%, uh, a general confirmation of Jesus' statements, uh, it's not... It doesn't have to be more than 50%, is what I'm saying. Wait, so it doesn't have to be a majority? No. I thought you said earlier, as long as it was a majority when you talked about the Torah. No, no, I, I, was saying that, I was saying that that's a point that makes sense, that you would identify something by the majority of its contents. It's an intuitive with point. The it's an intuitive point that I'm saying regarding the Torah. It's not a consistent approach where you have to apply this for every single thing. It's not a consistent approach. Yeah. So you have one approach for the Torah, and one approach uh, for the uh, this is No, this is one justification for the Torah specifically. It's not a justification for the Injil. But the Injil is affirmed as a reserved, inspired, and authoritative book like the Torah is. You're aware of that in the Quran? In a general sense, yes. But So you can generally affirm the minority part of a book? No, it's generally affirming a good chunk of the book. It doesn't have to be the majority, as I said. So a minority? A minority, if you're saying minority as in less than 50%, I can't give you an exact percentage. I'm right? asking for exact percentage. Just just like yeah. if it's not the majority that you're referring to, it must be the minority. So a prophet can come and affirm, affirm the minority of a book. He can affirm the contents that are from God, even if it's a minority. Okay. Where did he explicitly point out all the cases uh, where it agrees and where it doesn't agree? In, in sorry, repeat that. So in the Quran, where does it explicitly point out the parts that it agrees with and are preserved and then points out the parts that are corrupted and it does not affirm? Yeah, so are you talking about specifically in the Injil here? Yeah, in the Injil, we'll take the Injil. Yeah, in the Injil, yeah. So, so in the Injil, uh, there are parts of like the parable of the ten virgins, it's mentioned in the Quran. Um, mm. that, that is uh, contrasted and there's parts in there where the Quranic author obviously edits uh, the parable. Okay, but how do you know specifically what parts are preserved and what parts aren't? In by that what's confirmed, yeah, by what's confirmed in the Quran. Okay, so if the Quran is silent about an issue, what do you do? It's silent or agnostic. I mentioned this in my introductory. Okay, so let's take, for example, 
in the Torah, in Genesis 1936, I believe, although I'll get the verse up, it talks about Lot having sex uh, with his daughters. Does the Quran yeah. affirm this? No, it doesn't uh, affirm it. Does it deny it? It denies this uh, by extension of prophets not being able to commit uh, major sins. Where does it say that in the crime? It's an inference. It's not a verbatim, uh, oh, it's not verbatim word. It. Why it's is it extrapolated. even third, actually? It's extrapolated and inferred from other Quranic verses that make mention how prophets can't you lie. Can you tell me what those are? How, how, yeah, can, can you let me finish? So hmm? there's other so there's other uh, verses that make mention of uh, prophets not lying, as well as we whenever we do see uh, uh, um, alterations, they're usually in parts where prophets do sin. So Aaron, for example, creating the golden calf, or for example, uh, David, peace be upon him, uh, committing adultery and and, uh, and murder. Uh, in, instead, in the Quran, this is replaced with uh, obviously a parable being given. So uh, there's many instances where this is the case in the Quran, or even Solomon committing kufr, Solomon disbelieving. So on these cases, the Quran consistently edits these passages. Uh, so you can infer from that that this is, wouldn't be something that would be time uh, time's up. I still got three minutes left. No, <laughs> no. Right. If you, oh, sorry. Oh, oh, I'm tripping. I'm tripping. Yeah. No, it's seven minutes, isn't it? No, no, it's ten. Oh, okay. it's seven. That's my fault. That's my fault. Well, wait, sorry, it, it, it is ten. My bad. Yeah, ten. My bad. Sorry. All good. All good. Okay, cool. Uh, so I continue, right? Yeah, yeah I'm just. Time. I paused your time for a second, so right now I got two minutes and forty seconds left. <laughs> okay, cool. So in the in the Torah, it makes it clear in Genesis 1936 that Lot had sex with his daughters. The Quran, however, never explicitly denies this or even says this didn't take place. In fact, the Quran seems to infer the prophets did sin. So why not just accept that this did actually happen because the Quran seems to refer this as a principle? Yeah, so the conception that the Quran uh, presents is one of prophets being able to commit uh, the noob, meaning like sins, but in a, in a minor sense, not in a major sense. I gave you inferences that scholars would bring that would deny these particular instances as being, you know, these major sins, because it's, con it's a consistent theme where the Quran does reject these uh, narratives in the Bible that accuse these prophets of doing uh, heinous deeds and major sins. So it's a principle that's extrapolated and inferred from, from the text. Would you still hold that principle if I could show you that actually in the Quran it still even does affirm prophets doing sins? For example, Musa killing uh, an unarmed person, potentially a believer. Yeah, uh, that wouldn't be considered uh, a major sin because, uh, for, firstly, uh, that was like you can explain this in so many ways. Uh, first of all, uh, the legislation from God hadn't been given to Musa alayhi salam on particular, uh, particularly on this account. Secondly, uh, Musa alayhi salam. Uh, when he did unalive this person, he was doing it on the pretense that this person was uh, unjustly uh, harming someone. And lastly, he uh, didn't mean to, uh, to actually kill this person. He meant only to uh, push him away. Did Abraham lie? Yeah, uh, those those lies that Abraham committed uh, were white lies, or they they're, they're seen to be lies that were would be permissible. They, they aren't they aren't seen to be sins. How do you know they're permissible? Yeah, so there are certain cases where people can commit white lies, for example, or an Islamic this paradigm. Is like, uh, this is in the hadith. Okay, so the Quran is not a criteria for you. Uh, the Quran is part of my criteria. You're asking me from my perspective. I use both uh, Quran and hadith. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a Quranist, right? 30 right. seconds. So the Quran itself, though, is not a criteria. It is not a Muhammad or a Fulkan in the sense that 548 would have you assume. Oh, it is. Uh, it definitely is. And because it is, uh, it tells me to go to the hadiths. And because the criterion and uh, the Furqan and the Muhaymin, the, the guardian, tells me to go to the hadiths, tells me to go to the Prophet I extrapolate contents from there as well. So this is consistent within the Quranic narrative. Okay, so the Quran tells you that it's a criterion. That, that's and it. Yet you go to you go to other things. So, okay, it's not. But I'll, I'll let you if you want, if you wanted to just last ask that last question. I'll let Dean respond to that too. Since the, the time, or is that it? Good there. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'll, I'll just respond to that. So um, right. part of it being the, part let's of it. Let's let him restate the because I it, I yeah. turned him off a little bit. Go ahead and restate yeah. the question, last question, Chris. Oh, uh, so yeah, you you keep you have said, and I, I know it's a position that you take that you hold to Surah Al-Maidah, Ayah forty-eight, as mentioning the Quran as the criteria, Muhammad over the prior scriptures. 
But I'm pointing out that you actually don't hold this position. What you actually hold is a position where you take the Quran and other things that include hadith, schools of fiqh, scholarly works. Actually, that's your criteria. So in effect, Islam is your criteria. Right. So uh, can I ask a clarifying question for that? Sure, yeah. Okay. Uh, do you believe when the Quran says it's the criterion or it's the Muhammad, this is used in an absolute sense or is this general? So do you think do you think the Quran is a criterion over uh, even what's right and wrong in a, in, a, in a maths equation? I don't think the actual uh, word properly means criterion. Now, ignoring Ibrahim's little mistake of the seven minutes thing, but don't worry, Ibrahim, I forgive you. It's all good. We then move on to the cross section where Dean responds, asks me questions in regards to this topic. Now, the very kind of style of questions I had just given Dean, I respected the same in kind. But that wasn't what he was going for. And before he even gave his, his cross section and started asking me all these questions, he went away for like 30 seconds. He turned his camera off. And um, during this time, I think you can see Ibrahim just looking down on his phone like, mm -hmm. yeah, then he came back and he, the questions he had, I don't think he had really thought about them. I think these were questions he had got from like a Discord server or WhatsApp group or something. And he was just reading them on the fly. I mean, even looking back at the video footage, you can see as he asks me them, he's looking down, he's reading from a screen. Now, to be fair, I had made my questions already in note form. I had them written in front of me. But to be fair, a lot of it was just stuff that wasn't even on my list. It was just natural responses to things he was saying. But he was asking me these weird questions. And it was like, I asked him, okay, you need to tell me, is this this or this? When was this? Da -da -da -da. Very concise, very narrow questions, right? There's only really a yes or no answer. He can elaborate if he wants to, but it's very to the point. His questions were like the opposite. It was the most broad questioning I've ever seen. It was like, so in your opinion, what do you think the Quran author is trying to achieve? In regards to the contents of the Quran, does he wish for them to be contradictory or not contradictory? And I was just like, how, how do I even answer that? <laughs> And the, the sad thing is, is that I wanted to give him my actual thoughts, but to do that, I have to just keep talking. And I'm like, that's not going to help him. And I don't even think he knows where he's going with this. I'm like, how is this even relevant to the debate? So I just try and give him my honest answer and I try to keep it as concise as I can. I even try and help him out by saying, look, you need to ask more narrow questions because I can't just give you a quick answer to that. That's, it's like saying, hey, what's your opinion on the entire Quranic corpus generally? Like, generally, that's, that's a funny word. He used that word generally a lot. But I, I, was like, I can't give you that kind of level, that kind of broad answer. Um, but I thought maybe that was just like the first question, but then it was also kind of like the second question, then the third question. He asked me what I thought about, like, whether the Quran would allow itself to contradict itself. So I just referred to the Quran and they found it funny. <laughs> they were like, I don't know what was so funny. I just quoted the Quran to them um, and they were like, ha ha ha. Look at this Christian. He has quoted the Quran. But anyway, they finally kind of gave up and just started asking me questions about the Bible. So I kind of prefaced this from the beginning of the debate. I said, look, I'm not going to ask random questions about the Bible that have nothing to do with whether or not the Quran, the Islamic dilemma goes through. But they still did. So Matthew 23 came up and I just thought, wow, this is this is it. This is like this is how you defend the Islamic dilemma. You just Go, you just do another Christian is inconsistent argument. Despite the fact that anyone can make the Islamic dilemma argument. A Zoroastrian could make the Islamic dilemma argument. An atheist can make the Islamic dilemma argument. A Hindu person could make the Islamic dilemma argument. A Buddhist can make the Islamic dilemma argument. It's totally independent of what you believe. That's the interesting thing. It's purely based on objective facts. So the fact that they have to go to Christianity and bring that up and start being like, oh, you're a Christian, so you believe this, is um, it's a mere defeat. That's all they have. Like they just have to go back and go to other arguments. It's it's really weird. And the thing is, you can just admit to all of this. You can just be like, yeah, yeah, maybe you're right. Yeah. But how does that help you with the Islamic dilemma? Doesn't. Not even one bit. But I hope this is uh, at least demonstrated to you, ladies and gentlemen, that yeah, there is no hope for the Islamic dilemma. Uh, some master template will not save the Islamic dilemma. Discord messages during a live stream debate <laughs> will not help you on the Islamic dilemma. Having a... Islamic mod called Ibrahim by your side, pulling funny faces, will not save the Islamic dilemma because ultimately the Islamic dilemma passes. And it got, just to add, it got really bad when there wasn't many Muslim questions that were being asked towards me. 
So Ibrahim stepped up and said, hey, I'll, I'll ask you some questions. I thought, yeah, that's fine. You know, I'd, I'd rather have some questions than no questions because otherwise it feels one-sided. So Ibrahim asked me some questions, but they were, again, so open-ended. It's like he, he was talking about Surah Nisa Ayah 157 and how and what, what view I have of it. And I'm like, what's that got to do with the Islamic dilemma? What does that, what does it care about what my view is? Like, I could, I could have a view that <laughs> Surah Nisa Ayah 157 is the most poetic verse in all of the Quran, but, or or the least poetic verse on all the ground. What, what does it matter? What does it do to change anything? What my opinion is? Um, I felt like I was just giving people my opinion for most of that debate. It wasn't even I was being asked objective standards. It's just, what is your opinion on this? Here's my opinion. How do you think that works in relation to other things? Okay, here's my opinion. <laughs> chocolate ice cream or vanilla ice cream? Definitely chocolate ice cream. Who would win in a fight between Chuck Norris and Bruce Lee? Definitely Bruce Lee. I mean, to be honest, I enjoyed it because it's great to just bring up things that you've learned and just talking about your opinion. But it was a bit of a shame that it wasn't formulated as actually trying to defend against the Islamic dilemma, but just trying to, I don't know, like Christian thinks X, therefore the Islamic dilemma doesn't work. But oh well, it was enjoyable anyway. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And that's it, ladies and gentlemen, just a quick review of how that went. Hopefully I get into more debates like this because I thoroughly enjoyed it. And if you're not a Christian yet, then today is your day. You can email me at chris at speakerscorner at gmail.com and I will do my best to answer any theological questions about the Christian faith that you have. And I hope you all have a blessed day. And that includes you, Dean, and it includes you, Ibrahim. God bless. Take care.